Welcome to FactSpark. In this video, we'll take a closer look at how the rare gemstone called Amber is created, and in the end, I'll share some tips on how to find some of these shiny orange rocks yourself. If you're only here for the tips on hunting for Amber, you can skip to the timestamp that's shown on the screen right now. Just like humans or animals, trees are living things which over time evolved to be stronger and more resilient to their environment, to predators and to disease. This is usually done by growing thicker bark, thorns or changing in a way that prevents premature death or increased reproduction. Some 50 million years ago, however, the family of trees called Pinacea started excreting a sticky and dark orange colored substance, which gave them a very useful defense against pesky little insects trying to infiltrate into the stump. The resin, which is produced in the center of the stump, slowly flows outwards to seal any holes or scratches in the bark. The resin is self-hardening, so that after it fills the tree's wounds, it prevents external influences from entering the bark. Its antiseptic properties prevent infectious disease from entering and the stickiness prevents chewing insects from further harming the tree. The resin hardens with roughly the same principle as superglue turns from a liquid to a solid material. Volatile molecules such as oils, acids and alcohols keep the organic compounds in short chains, meaning that the material is liquid. Over time, however, the volatile molecules dissipate and evaporate, meaning that the organic chains are able to form longer and longer polymers, which turns the resin into harder and harder shapes until it finally reaches the stage of being amber. Unlike superglue, however, which hardens within minutes or even seconds, pine resin can take anywhere from many hundreds of thousands to millions of years to reach hardness equivalent to the one of rocks. Also, the hardening to a level where the resin is considered amber only works if the resin is deposited in a way that its organic compounds are protected from anything that may compost it, for example in an oxygen-starved space under water or buried under thick layers of material. While amber can theoretically be found anywhere in the world, as long as resin-bearing trees have been growing there within the past 50 million years, there are spots in the world where your chances of finding some are significantly increased. Contrary to what you might expect though, amber is not usually found at places where you today find a lot of resin. For amber to form, the resin must be millions of years old and deposited in a protected location where it has been untouched from organisms and oxygen for a very long time. And this is usually not applicable to forest floors. Instead, your best bet tends to be at the bottom of a lake or sea where resin has been deposited a few million years ago and has been given time to mature into amber. Probably the most famous of these sea floors, where all parameters within the past 50 million years were matching, is the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe. Up until a few hundred thousand years ago, the region between today's Sweden and Finland on one side, and Poland and the Baltic States on the other side, was a white plain with a large river system which carried all the water from northeastern Europe towards the Atlantic Ocean. It is estimated that in this time, large amounts of pine tree stumps, and therefore also the pine resin, was carried and deposited around the Baltic Sea Basin from the surrounding rivers. With periodically expanding and declining ice masses from the ice ages along the river system, however, the basin was carved wider and wider, until it finally reached the shape of today's permanently flooded, 415 square kilometer large Baltic Sea. Since the Baltic Sea only has an average depth of around 55 meters, the seafloor is strongly affected and regularly stirred up by stronger storms. This regularly sets free the deposited amber stones from the upper layers of the seafloor. Under just the right conditions of salinity, temperature, shape and composition of the amber, these rocks actually float in water and the currents and winds can now carry it to shore where amber enthusiasts can collect the little gemstones. These preconditions make the Baltic Sea a hotspot for amber hunters, and it's strongly embraced in the cultures of the surrounding cities and villages. While it is one of the most famous places in the world to search for amber, it is by far not the only one. Many shorelines across the globe have been used to collect amber, and here's a quick guide if you want to find some yourself. 
Even though it may sound quite straightforward from this point to simply collect the amber at your nearest shoreline, there's still a few things to keep in mind if you want your hunt to be successful. Step 1. Timing. Since most accessible amber is deposited in the seafloor, it is best to start hunting after a storm has stirred up the seabed. The light and sometimes buoyant rock then gets released from its deposit. Additionally, the amber, which has been set afloat in your chosen body of water, still somehow needs to get to you. Which brings us to step 2. Wind. Since currents are often given by the direction of the wind, you are looking for a wind direction facing towards you when looking at the sea. As an example, if you're standing on a beach in eastern Denmark, you want western winds, and when you're standing on a beach north of Gdansk in Poland, you are looking for northern winds. This is to ensure that the floating amber actually gets carried towards you. Step 3. Seaweed and Driftwood. Washed up driftwood and seaweeds are likely to have swept the surface of the water for quite a bit before they were washed ashore. The odds of an amber stone getting tangled up in the process are certainly possible, so these are always worth checking when looking for amber. Step 4. Identification. Since amber in the end is just hardened tree resin, it actually is organic material. This means that it reflects UV lights when hit by a strong enough ray. Luckily, the refraction of amber, which shines in orange, gives a slightly different color than other things you might encounter, like mussels, which shine in a more whitish or bluish tone. Therefore, a UV lamp is your best friend to make the amber stand out between inorganic sand and other material. Now that you have perfectly followed everything from step 1 to step 4, it is time for the by far most important step. Step 5. Luck. Even though all criteria might be right, you still have to be lucky that amber, which has been traveling Earth's forests, rivers and seas for millions of years, washes up exactly at the right time and the right place where you're looking for it. There's a good reason why it has been considered a rare gemstone since the beginning of civilization. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and leave a like. Until then, good luck with your next amber hunt. Cheers.